I uh, have a distinct honor and privilege that I'm going to be speaking about my friend, Murray Rothbard. And what I'm going to do is a little bit about what he stood for intellectually and movement building wise, and a little bit about my own personal stories with him. Uh, the benefit of that is it's not really that public, whereas what Murray has done is there for everyone to know. So I'm going to do a little of each, plus I'll tell a little bit about my own story. And I'd like to recommend this book, which is a compilation of the stories of how did you become a libertarian or how did you first become an Austrian economist. And the, uh, most of the people in this book are the professors at this week's long lecture. The one that, if you're perusing it, that brings tears to my eyes every time I read it is Joe Salernos, who is not known as a dramatic person, but the, his story in here is worth the whole price of admission as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so a little bit about myself. Uh, I was born in Brooklyn, and I went to Madison High School with Bernie Sanders. Uh, <laughs> Uh, he and I were friends. We were both on the track team. He was one of the best runners in the city. I was sort of uh, uh, not, a, not that good of a runner. I, I saw the rear end of him disappearing around the track many times. And I had the same views as he did. And uh, we both uh, went to Madison High School for four years and then Brooklyn College for one year. And when I was a senior at Brooklyn College, Bernie went off to Chicago, so we sort of diverged in many ways. But when I was a senior in um, Brooklyn College, I was still a pinko commie like Bernie or a Bernieite. And Ayn Rand came to lecture at Brooklyn College, and I came to boo and hiss her because she was evil, because she favored free enterprise. And everyone knew that if you favored capitalism, you hated the poor and you wanted to see starvation and, and you wanted to see the rich uh, you know, exploit the poor. So I was booing and hissing her, and I didn't get enough booing and hissing, but by the, uh, at the end of the uh, lecture, what happened was uh, they announced that the Ayn Rand Study Club that had invited her to speak there was having a lunch in her honor, and anyone could come. And I was ready to you know, kick some more butt and show her that she was wrong and converted to the true socialist faith. <laughs> and there was this long, long table, maybe 50 people on a side, and Ayn Rand was sitting at the head of it, and Nathaniel Brannon and Leonard uh, Peikoff and... Um, uh, uh, Greenspan and, and all the, uh, the senior collective, as they called it. And I was relegated to the foot of the table, at, way at the other end. And I turned to my neighbor and I said, this capitalist stuff is no good. Socialism is the way to go. And they said, well, you know, I don't really know about that, but go up to the other end of the table. And I was maybe, oh, I don't know, 22 or so, maybe 21. I was a senior in college. And Ayn Rand was maybe 50, Nathaniel Brandon 35 or so, and the others were uh, adults older than me. And I, I was a chutzpahnik in those days, still am sort of pushy. And I, uh, and I stuck my head between Ayn's and Nathaniel Brandon's, and I said, there's a socialist here who wants to debate someone on socialism and capitalism. And they said, who is it? I said, me. And uh, they were amazed. And, uh, but Brandon was very nice. He said, look, I'll come to the other end of the table and sit and talk with you on two conditions. Can't sit here. There's no room. The two conditions are, one, that I promise not to let the conversation lapse after uh, this time, but we continue until we settle this, and I promised. And the second thing is he said, read two books that I'll recommend. One was Atlas Shrugged by Ayn Rand. The other was Economics in One Lesson by Henry Hazlitt. And I went to, uh, I agreed, we discussed things, and I uh, must have gone to his house, oh, four or five times, uh, Ayn Rand's house, his house, and I read the two books. And lo and behold, I was converted to, um, uh, not libertarianism, but to objectivism. And I wasn't really interested in most of objectivism, the philosophy, metaphysics, epistemology. I was mainly interested in the economics of it. And I got the Henry Hazlitt message and the Ayn Rand message that markets are good and markets help people. I would then go to the NBI lectures. And if you ask the nice question of Ayn Rand, like on page 32, you said this, could you please elaborate? Or where did you get the idea from? She would be very nice and gentle and talk to you. But if you said, well, on page 32, you said this. But on page 403, you said that. And I see a contradiction. She would say, get out. <laughs> and, and, and she was serious. I mean, <laughs> I mean, when Tom Woods asked me nasty questions, I joke about you know, kicking him out of the room. But <laughs> wasn't serious. So 
I, I would sort of leave in disgust because that's not the way to do anything. But then I would have an approach avoidance because that, that was the only group that I knew of that was free market. And then uh, I met uh, Larry Moss, who was my fellow student in, um, uh, at Columbia. And he said, you got to meet this guy, Murray Rothbard. He's an anarchist. And I said, anarchist? You know, that's evil. I don't want <laughs> to meet Murray Rothbard. He's, you know, crazy. And uh, Jerry Wallows was his roommate. And Jerry and Larry um, ganged up on me. And somehow, after four or five uh, threats to my life that I should meet Murray, I finally met Murray. And I thought, you know, Murray would be sort of like one of these guys, you know, six foot two and muscles from here to there and, and carrying a gun and a spear, sort of like uh, <laughs> the, those Black Panther types. And he was this short, fat little guy and just giggling away. It, it, it sort of blew my mind. Uh, Murray and I have a lot in common. We're both short, fat New York City Jews. <laughs> We're both atheists. We both married Shixes who were taller than us. Shix is a Christian girl, for those who don't know that. Uh, neither of us got a divorce. We both write a lot. Both got PhDs at Columbia. Um, both have a sense of humor. Both Austro-Libertarians. Uh, my big problem with Murray was stomach cramps. Because I'd be in his house from 6 in the evening till about 6 in the next morning, and I'd leave and my stomach hurt from laughing because he'd have you in stitches for 12 hours straight. It was really cruel and unusual punishment. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Murray was just so funny and, and gossip and talking about this guy. And, and uh, we used to play Risk. And in Risk, the idea is to take over the world. And Murray would cackle, I'm going to take over the world, you know, I'm going to be the dictator of the world. And uh, it was just ludicrous because, you know, Murray was against taking over the world by anyone. So um, we also were born in New York City and we both went west, him to UNLV, me to the Fraser Institute in Canada. So we have a lot in common. But I have one thing over Murray. I won the Murray Rothbard Medal of Freedom and he never did. Ha <laughs> 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 ha. <laughs> Of course, the, the reason he didn't win it, it was named after him, so he could hardly win the medal in, in his own honor. So uh, in about 10 minutes uh, or so, he, uh, he convinced me about uh, anarchism. And, uh, and I was a, a dead set against this anarchism stuff. It, it couldn't work. It, it's evil, whatever. And uh, Murray made the, the following points. He said, well, right now, the relationship of China and Chile is one of anarchy. There's no world government above them. The relationship of, uh, of the US and uh, Spain is one of anarchy. There's no world government. Do you want world government? <laughs> and obviously, I didn't. And that was a very, very powerful argument that sort of upended me. Another one was uh, he was using, uh, you know, in karate, when somebody comes at you, you punch him. In judo, when someone comes at you, you sort of toss him over the shoulder, use his momentum. Well, Murray used judo on me. I was into the Hazlitt stuff about why markets work for carrots and shoes. And he said, well, why couldn't it work for police and courts? And he sort of explained that. And it sort of clicked into me. The other one that Murray meant, uh, mentioned at that time was, uh, well, how does government start up? Is it unanimous? When did any government ever start up that was unanimous? And I couldn't come up with any uh, reason. And then the, the idea of secession. We believe in uh, anything between consenting adults, and, and nobody should be forced to do anything. But government is, unless they allow you to secede and down to the individual level, which is anarchy. I mean, what we really want, we're not against government. We, we want to have 7 billion governments, one for each. You, you get it? So. Uh, like if you ask a girl out for a date, you have to get your foreign minister to deal with her foreign minister. <laughs> In other words, we're all sovereign. <laughs> and uh, Murray was uh, very much against public choice, which I was sort of into, and you know this theoretical unanimity that Buchanan and Tulloch come up with. So Murray really uh, did a number on me, and. Uh, uh, I, I was converted to anarchism in about 15 minutes. It was probably one of the quickest conversions uh, ever. And uh, it took a little longer for me to get into Austrian economics because uh, the synthetic a priori, which I went into in my other lecture, uh, and also I had a, a vested interest. I was still getting my PhD under Gary Becker, who was a logical positivist, so it was a harder sell, but eventually I got it. I want to tell you a few uh, stories. 
Uh, one is with uh, Roger Garrison. Is Roger here? Oh, there he is. Uh, Roger is a very nice guy, very polite, and he came uh, to Murray's living room, and there were a whole bunch of us there, and uh, it must have, maybe we had dinner, and it was 9 o'clock, and Roger uh, was just writing his stuff about the, the triangle and, 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 and the stuff that's now in his books. That was the very beginning of it. And um, 9.30 came, 10 o'clock, 10.30, and Roger starts making motions to leave. Uh, because he was a polite guy, and you, know, you visit someone's house, and it's 10.30 or 11 o'clock, and you start to leave. And Murray's saying, what are you doing, Roger? <laughs> <You know? laughs> Why are you leaving? Uh, Murray's uh, schedule, he would get up at around 2 in the afternoon and go to sleep at around 6 in the morning, 7 in the morning. <laughs> so uh, a Murray salon lasted until 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. And you know, poor Roger is probably on a normal schedule. So that was uh, one interesting uh, story about how Murray and, and Roger um, somehow had to reconcile their time, time dimensions. Another one I wanted to tell you about is Murray and Hans. Hans Hoppy. Uh, Murray is 15 years older than me. I'm 75. I think Hans is about 10 or 12 years younger than me. So Murray is about 25 years older than Hans. And I remember when Hans first came to, to the city and became part of our group. And I have to draw you a little picture of the way I see libertarianism. And nobody better laugh at my art. This is, this is modern art. And later on, I'm going to sing a song. And nobody better laugh at how I sing, which is equally pathetic. But anyway. <laughs> Uh, this is a, a teepee, like uh, the native Indians have a teepee. And this here, for me, is the non-aggression principle and um, <coughs> private property rights based on homesteading. homesteading. And that's what uh, libertarianism is for me. Libertarian is, for me, this little bit of non-aggression principle and and uh, homesteading and uh, private property rights. And what these are are implications, uh, implications of, of the theory. You know, what's our view on um, uh, the minimum wage? Uh, well, it's coercive because someone is told that they can't uh, uh, rent their labor at a certain price. What's our view on legalizing uh, marijuana? What's our view on war? These are all implications of the non-aggression principle. So what's up here? What's up here is the justifications of the non-aggression principle. Now, the Randians would say A equals A. That's their justification. <laughs> Don't ask. Uh, they have a whole song and dance about that. The religious people would say God. God is the one who uh, ordained that we have the non-aggression principle. I'm talking about libertarians, uh, different justifications of it. Murray had this thing called natural rights. Uh, other people have other justifications for it. My own justification was sort of, uh, if you don't believe in it, you're, you're an idiot. It wasn't, 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 wasn't very sophisticated, but you know, we all have our justifications. And my own interests are not so much in justifying the non-aggression principle and homesteading and property rights, but rather the implications of them. In any case, Hans comes along with this thing called argument from argument. The idea here, very briefly, uh, I won't do full justice to it, but you must read Hans on this, is that um, the only way to settle anything is through argument. So what's true in argument? Well, what's true in argument is that you're conceding that your opponent has a right to speak. Otherwise, you can't have much of an argument. And if he has a right to speak, he has lungs and a larynx and a pharynx, and he has a, a place to stand on. Namely, he's conceding private property rights. So if he denies private property rights, if he stands there and has the audacity to say private property rights are wrong, he's using private property rights to say that, and therefore he can't say it, he has to shut up, which is a very nice argument. But Murray had natural rights as his argument. And how did Murray react to Hans? I mean, Hans was this young pup kid, and Murray was uh, 50 years old or, or so, and Hans was 25 or, or so. And uh, what Murray said was Hans was right. I mean, you wouldn't find Ayn Rand doing anything like that. Uh, uh, I, I mean, this sort of, sort of shows Murray's character, that Murray uh, would uh, follow Hans, a, a young kid who was a follower of Murray and loved and revered Murray, as, as we all did. 
And uh, to me, this sort of bespeaks Murray's personality, which is perhaps even more important than his contribution. Well, I'm not, I don't want to get into the, which is more important. I mean, he's made magnificent contributions. But this idea that he would be so open to his um, followers like, uh, or students, and Hans was never a formal student, nor was I, but we were students in, in the uh, very important sense of that. Another uh, thing that I follow from Murray is when I first met Murray, I called him Dr. Rothbard or Professor Rothbard. I said, no, 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 Murray, Murray. And um, that's the way I try to treat my students and people when you call me Professor Block. I mean, a lot of what I am is because of Murray. I, I just sort of follow him, not slavishly. I don't agree with him on everything, just 99.9% .9 of everything. But I, uh, I follow him. Whenever I'm in doubt, I ask, how, what would Murray think about this? I think about Murray pretty much every day. Uh, I have this horrible experience uh, uh, that I have to tell you about. Uh, my present wife, Mary Beth, once asked if, um, if she and Murray were drowning, who would I save? <laughs> <laughs> and, and like an idiot, I said, Murray. <laughs> and, and I'm lucky she didn't break up with me. <laughs> uh, in my next life, I'll be cooler. <laughs> So this is a word uh, of advice for you uh, people here. Uh, Murray used to say, we kept looking around for the in crowd. And finally, we realized we were the in crowd. <laughs> so uh, I think, in, in some sense, the way I see the Mises Institute, and I mean no uh, disrespect to Mises, but the way I see the Mises Institute, this is sort of Murray Rothbard's living room writ large. Murray Rothbard had a, a living room, which was uh, uh, a, uh, a big uh, living room, and we'd all sit around and cackle and discuss uh, stuff. And uh, there was this long, long hallway uh, that looked sort of like uh, the, the walls here, namely it had books from floor to ceiling. And the way I see it, it it's almost that the Mises Institute is more of the spirit of Murray Rothbard than Mises. I'm just speculating here, and uh, I hope I'm not insulting anyone. But... Uh, uh, Mises was sort of more narrow, mainly economics, whereas Murray was economics, but everything else under the sun, from sociology to, poli to politics to strategy to uh, anarchism to uh, war and peace to history. So, uh, and the Mises Institute, to me, is, is more like the spirit of Murray than Mises, but uh, Mises came first, and Mises was uh, Murray's teacher. Uh, let me talk a little bit about Murray's strategy. Uh, Murray's been criticized for his strategy because sometimes he's a lefty and sometimes he's a righty. Sometimes he's a, a peace and freedom person. Sometimes he's a, 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 a what do you call it, um, a paleo conservative. What's going on there? Well, you have to realize that when I first met Murray, this was in 1965 or 66, something like that, we libertarians were very few. I once asked Murray, how many libertarians uh, were there in the whole world? And he said, 25. 25 libertarians in the whole world in, in 1966. Nowadays, I mean, you walk down the street and every fifth person, well, I'm exaggerating, is a libertarian, but we are everywhere. The gays say we're everywhere. Well, we are everywhere also. Not that we're gay, well, well some of us. I'm, let, me, <laughs> let, me, let me not go into that. I get, I get distracted by my own eloquence here. <laughs> so uh, I, I remember the Peace and Freedom Party. And this is during the war in Vietnam. And how many libertarians were in Murray's uh, little coterie? Oh, six or eight or ten. That was it. And uh, we joined the Peace and Freedom Party. And the Peace and Freedom Party had, oh, maybe 300 progressive labor. These were the Maoists. And uh, maybe 150 um, Trotskyites, both bad guys. But they were against the war in Vietnam. So we made a common cause with them. And there must have been eight or 10 of us uh, libertarians. I, I forget exactly who was there. Joe, were you uh, part of that uh, piece? Of, Joe, uh, Joe was a baby. He was in diapers at that time. Uh, so he, he, his mother wouldn't let him stay out late or something. I <laughs> yeah, I mean, he looks like an old man now, but he was a baby when I first met him. Uh, I think uh, Jerry Tuchili and maybe Larry Moss and, and Jerry Wallows and Leonard Liggio and, and uh, Joe Peden and people like and, and maybe uh, Ralph and Ron, Ralph Rako and Ron Hamaway. So we were about 10 of us. And we had to make a common cause. Uh, we were on the side of the progressive labor against the Trotskyites whenever there was a dispute. 
And I remember one time, remember I was doing my PhD dissertation on rent control, and we had a deal with the, uh, the progressive labor. They would come out in favor of the gold standard, and we would come out in favor of rent control. So we were having a vote, and, and I was sort of like that guy in, in that movie, you know, uh, the, the Nazi salute and all. <laughs> they want, Murray told me to vote for rent control. And I said, Murray, I can't vote for, so vote for rent control. So I voted for rent control. And, and the interesting part was how did the progressive labor people justify to their group that we should favor the gold standard of all things? So it, it, it was sort of a hoot. I mean, I sort of followed Murray around like a, a slavish dog. I mean, a, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I, I mean, I was just so much in love with him. Now comes the song. Are you ready for the song? To know, know, know him is to love, love, love him. And I do. No applause for myself. <laughs> <laughs> my singing is roughly on par with my art, artistry. And, uh, but I love Murray. I had a bromance with him. I, I, I was, <laughs> look, if Donald can have a bromance with uh, Putin, I can have one with Murray. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I just, my big problem with Murray is I, would, I was this young kid just getting my PhD, and I would read Man, Economy, and State. And then I knew that that night I would go and speak to Murray, and he would he would be friendly with me. And I didn't think I was deserving of friendship with this genius. I mean, it's sort of like, like I was having dinner with Mozart or something. I mean, it's just, uh, I, I see Murray as the Mozart or the Bach of libertarianism and Austrianism. Uh, I'm a big fan of Mozart and Bach and music. And I had to be worthy of him. And how could I be worthy of him? The only way I could think of being worthy with him is to be very critical, hypercritical. So, I would, you know, uh, just make stupid things up to, to be worthy of him. And he just wanted to be friends with me. I, I couldn't get that through my stupid thick head, that he would want to be friends with me. And I think I speak for all of the faculty members here when I say that we want to be friends with you. We don't want to be put on a pedestal or anything like that. We see you as the next generation. We see you as the people that we are handing over the baton that Murray and Mises handed over to us. So think of that when you think of us uh, faculty members. Uh, I have to tell you another story. I, uh, the last, uh, Mises had a, well, Mises had a tough career, as did Murray, as did I. We, we three had uh, that in common as well. I didn't get tenure until I was 61 when I went to uh, Loyola University, and I got fired in oh, four or five or six jobs, not because I'm not amiable and not because I can't draw and not because I can't sing, <laughs> but because of my views, obviously. And uh, Ludwig von Mises had a hard time also. He uh, was a professor at NYU, but NYU didn't pay his salary. It was paid for by businessmen who liked Mises. And Mises had seminars, and uh, the very last seminar, Murray dragged all of his living room crowd to Mises. And uh, Mises was very old, and he could hardly hear, and he could hardly speak, and Percy Graves would sort of translate for him. He would tell Mises the question. Percy Graves had a very loud voice. This is the husband of uh, Bettina Bien Graves, who was Mises' secretary for many years. And um, I got to shake Mises' hand. And I never washed it since. <laughs> so, so if you shake my hand, you channel Mises. <laughs> That's my, my Mises story. OK, what else do I have? Murray. Uh, let me talk a little bit about his public accomplishments and get off me and Murray and my relationship with him just for a minute. I'll get back to that. <laughs> Murray was a magnificent Austrian economist in the tradition of Menger, Bombavirk, uh, Mises, uh, Hayek, uh, and then Rothbard. He, uh, his Man, Economy, and State is, is a trip. You must read. I'm very jealous of you people because some of you will be reading Man, Economy, and State for the first time. I will never be able again to read Man, Economy, and State for the first time. Maybe for the sixth time the first time, but not for the first time. So you people are lucky. Uh, he made uh, contributions in uh, the Depressions, the Logic of Action, one and two. Every area of economics, micro, macro, labor, money, methodology, history, trade, public choice, law and economics, air pollution. In air pollution, the best thing ever written on environmental economics, as far as I'm concerned, is a thing that Murray wrote in 1982. I forget the exact title, but it has air pollution in it. And for me, the, the, uh, the breakthrough was seeing that dust particles are a trespass. 
And once I could put things in the, in the uh, uh, system of, of uh, property rights, then, then the uh, problems uh, seemed easy to me to solve. But air pollution before looking at it that way uh, was difficult. In other words, it's not so much clean air that we're worried about, it's rather uh, dust particles coming from my factory into your lungs and into your laundry when we had laundry out on clotheslines. And once I saw that, I, it was sort of like the, uh, the curtains uh, came apart and I could see the problem for what it, for what it was. And I've done a lot of work on my own uh, on that. Another one is uh, blackmail. The other day I showed you an entire book that I wrote on blackmail. Where did I get that from? I got that from Man, Economy, and State. And I think Murray mentioned blackmail in three sentences, sort of as a throwaway that blackmail is not uh, per se a violation of property rights because all you're threatening is to be a gossip. So a lot of my work comes from uh, little bits and pieces that Murray wrote and I just sort of expanded on them. I have to tell you another story. Uh, when I uh, was a youngster, I used to keep track of how many pages I could write in a day. Pages were 300 words, so if I did three pages, that was 900 words, and I figured, you know, that's okay, uh, pretty good. Most days, or many days, I would do five pages with 1,500 words, and I was very happy when I did five pages. Every once in a rare while, I could do 10 or 15 pages. One day, I got up early in the morning, maybe 8 in the morning, and I worked until 2 the next morning, and I did 23 pages. So I'm, you know, full of myself, and I call up Murray and say, well, how many pages do you do in a day? And Murray goes, wah, wah. <laughs> that, <that's, laughs> you ask Murray, what do you think of the state? He says, wah, wah. <laughs> so he said, wah, wah, to me. Uh, and he says, who counts? You know, what are you, an idiot counting pages? <laughs> he didn't say that. It was too polite, but that was what he meant. <laughs> And I, I was very persistent, very pushy, and he was so gentle with me. I remember one time I saw a picture of Mises on the wall, and I said, Murray, why do you have a picture of Mises on the wall? Uh, Mises isn't an anarchist. And Murray was so kind and gentle. He, he could have said, get out or something. He said, you know, just read a little Mises. You'll, you'll come to understand. But it shows you how weird I was when I, well, I'm still weird in many ways, but, <laughs> but how super weird I was when I was very young and being tutored by Murray. So anyway, I, uh, I persisted. I, I said, Murray, you've got to tell me how many pages you do. And uh, he said, uh, what was it, 800? Eight pages an hour. Eight pages, an, thanks. I need, I need all the help I can get. You see, I'm getting senile. Eight pages an hour. So in my best day of 23, call it 24 pages, I did three hours of his work. Now look, I'm not comparing quality. I would never dare compare quality, but just quantity. In my best day uh, of a whole day, I did call it 24, and, and he did eight pages an hour. Now, a good typist could do better than that. A good typist does 100 words an hour, could do better than that. But this is Murray uh, creating new stuff. Uh, Lou tells me the story just the other day that Murray was once uh, supposed to um, uh, do a paper from, for some conference, and uh, he figured he had another month to do it. And Joey, his wife, his beloved wife, uh, said, no, 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 it's due tomorrow. So Murray just went into another room uh, in the middle of the party and uh, typed out some uh, 15 pages or something like that and took him three hours of 15, well, two hours, eight pages an hour, 16-page paper. Murray was very, very prolific. I mean, Murray has written, if you stretched on, on, a, uh, on a bookcase how many uh, pages of stuff Murray ever published, it's amazing. And now uh, Murray is still publishing stuff from the Volcker Fund days that books keep coming out where Murray would give the Volcker Fund his idea, well, what does he think of Kersner? What does he think of Buchanan? And, and Murray would write 30 or 40 pages on each of them. And, and these are now being published by the Mises Institute, and they are precious. So Murray is, is just a, a, a monumental writer. But he wasn't just a, uh, uh, an economist. He was also a libertarian theorist. Uh, he brought together uh, history and, and sociology and politics and economics and, and made a libertarian uh, philosophy that had never been existing before. And in this, I would recommend The Ethics of Liberty and For a New Liberty, uh, which are both magnificent, monumental works on, on liberty. He was also a historian. Uh, he did um, uh, the 1819, that was his dissertation, the, the, well, sort of economic history, and he did a, a four or five volume uh, thing on, on the early United States, and just that is, is this wide on, on a bookshelf. I mean, when Murray writes a book, it's 
1,100 pages. Uh, he, he was just a, a phenomenon. Okay, so I was telling you a little bit about the Peace and Freedom Party. That's one sort of uh, an activist thing that he did. Why did he do it? He wasn't a lefty, even though uh, Buckley was accusing Murray of being a commie or something like that. He just wanted the war in Vietnam to end, and um, uh, that was the only way that his group of 10 people could have any effect. So he joined the left on, on, on a limited basis, not for everything. He, he didn't follow communism or anything like that, but just in terms of, of um, anti-war, he joined that group. Later on, uh, he joined the paleoconservative group uh, for very similar reasons, uh, because we were very small and uh, they were much larger than us, and there were certain overlaps between us and the paleoconservatives. So this was his attempt to magnify the power of the few people that he uh, was associated with. And his critics say, well, he's inconsistent. Well, I don't think he's inconsistent. One of the very first things I ever wrote under Murray's tutelage was an attack on um, Milton Friedman, who wanted to uh, get rid of the draft during the Vietnam War. Well, you might think, what do we, favor the draft? Of course we don't favor the draft. But the reason that he wanted to favor the draft, getting rid of the draft, was to make the US Army more efficient in Vietnam. And I certainly didn't favor that. This, I think, was one of the first things that I ever wrote and published in um, uh, the Libertarian Forum, which was Murray's um, magazine or newsletter. And it, you get similar problems, like uh, suppose we have the Laffer Curve business where, where right now taxes are 90%. We're thinking uh, we're, of reducing the tax rate from 90 to 85. Well, do we favor it? Yes, we favor it, even though the government will have more money. Namely, we favor it in spite of the government having more money. Similarly, if we legalize drugs, the government will tax it and the government will have more money, which we don't favor. So some people say, well, we shouldn't legalize drugs. No, I think the right answer that I get from Marie is, yes, we want to legalize drugs in spite of the fact that the government will have more money because freedom is freedom, and, and we're more deontological than we are uh, utilitarian. Um, what else do I have here? Ah, the Carl Hess uh, episode. Uh, Carl Hess was, when Murray first met Carl Hess, uh, Carl Hess was a writer for Barry Goldwater. And I think he was uh, responsible for the famous Barry Goldwater statement that extremism in defense of liberty is no vice and moderation in pursuit of virtue is, no, is not a good thing. And uh, when Murray first met Carl, Carl was a very much of a righty. Uh, and not in the good sense, because... The way I see it, and I'll, I'll draw something else for you people. You know, a lot of people see that this is the left and that's the right, and where does libertarianism fit in? Whenever I take a survey, I answer the economic questions like a, a righty and then the personal liberties like a lefty, so I come out as a moderate. And even though I call myself Walter, Walter Moderate Block, I'm really not moderate. <laughs> but a much better way to look at it is here is libertarianism, here is the right, and here is the left. And I think that we are equally distant from both. We're not part of the right. We're not part of the left. We're, sort of, we're something unique. Uh, we agree with the right a little bit on economics and with the left a little bit on foreign policy. And, and we don't agree with them at all on, 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 uh, on foreign policy, rather on domestic policy. Uh, personal liberties, we agree a little bit more with the left, although the left isn't all that good and the right isn't all that good on economics. Well, the way I see it, we're, we're a unique philosophy. We're different than the other two. We're not part of either of them. And uh, Murray was uh, attacked Frank Meyer for fusionism. Frank Meyer was trying to say, well, the libertarians and the right are really buddies. And the Federalist Society is predicated on this idea that libertarians are sort of part of the right. I, I, I personally don't see it. Uh, every once in a while, uh, some libertarian will say, well, we're really part of the left, the right is hateful, or, or they'd say, we're really part of the, the left, the right is hateful. I agree with both. <laughs> the left and the right are equally hateful, and, and we're very different than them. So anyway, Carl Hess starts in with Murray, and um, Carl is very much over here, and then Carl starts moving toward libertarianism. And uh, he did his interview with the penthouse or playboy or one of those and at that time he was really a Rothbardian he was magnificent and then Carl just sort of kept moving toward the left and 
it, it, it wasn't a good experience. Uh, Murray didn't fully succeed. Murray succeeded in getting him to, to libertarianism, but then Carl flitted away and um, uh, was not a, uh, a libertarian anymore toward the end of his life. Another thing is this thing called CLS, Center for Libertarian Studies. This was a precursor, if you will, to the Mises Institute. Uh, this was a, a group where uh, we met in New York City. Walter Greiner was there, Peden, uh, Hamaway, um, uh, Ralph Rako, uh, Ron Hamaway, uh, uh, John Hagel, um, uh, Randy Barnett, some of Murray's uh, confidants. And we try to have a... Uh, uh, an institute, sort of like the Mises Institute, and it didn't work all that well. It lasted for a few years. There were some disputes with the funding source. Uh, and thank God for the Mises Institute, which is now what Murray had always hoped CLS would be, uh, something just like this, where we get young people and, and we uh, do uh, research and, and we have uh, the Quarterly Journal of Austrian Economics and, and we have other publications and many, many books that are made available for a very low price so people can, can learn about it. And we have uh, lourockwell.com, which is uh, another favorite of mine. I contribute a bit to it and then there's a blog. Uh, there's just so much that uh, the Mises Institute is offering. What else have I got here? I want to read something from uh, a friend of mine, Wendy McElroy. Wendy McElroy and I are fellow Murray Rothbard, I won't say worshipers, but um, uh, big fans of. And here's what Wendy said. In 45 years of scholarship and activism, Rothbard produced over two dozen books and thousands of articles that made sense of the world from a radical individualist perspective. In doing so, it is no exaggeration to say that Rothbard created the modern libertarian movement. Specifically, he refined and fused together natural law theory using a basic Aristotelian or Randian approach, the radical civil libertarianism of the 19th century, individualist anarchists, especially Lysander Spooner and Benjamin Tucker, the free market philosophy of Austrian economists, in particular Ludwig von Mises, into which he incorporated sweeping economic histories, and the foreign policy of the American old right, that is isolationism. Ron Paul wouldn't call it isolationism, but... Uh, that, that would be one term for, for you know, U.S. Uh, staying out of other people's business. What was it John Quincy Adams said? Uh, we don't go uh, uh, searching for monsters to destroy. And uh, George Washington said, uh, peace uh, with all uh, nations, no, no, no uh, entangling alliances, that sort of a thing. Continuing, uh, Wendy. As a result of the fusion, libertarianism blossomed into the 60s as the philosophy of absolute individual rights based on natural law, of rights that were expressed domestically through the free market and internationally through the non-aggression isolationism with its corollary of unbridled free trade. Uh, the unbridled free trade means none of these NAFTA, CAFTA, IPP things. You just have a unilateral declaration of free trade with every country. And if the other countries want to have tariffs on our products, God bless them, let them do it. If there are two men in a rowboat and one guy shoots a hole in the rowboat, the other guy shouldn't shoot another hole in the rowboat. If they're stupid enough to shoot a ho one hole in the rowboat, that's their problem. We don't have to do that. We favor full free trade with everyone. It's sort of the Hong Kong uh, principle. But more than this, continuing Wendy, following in the footsteps of his mentor, the pioneering Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, Rothbard grounded human liberty in human nature. Developing an explicit philosophy of liberty, he drove his insights through history to re-examine the real implication and meaning of events such as the American Revolution. He laid a moral foundation for freedom and then used it to springboard into a strategy by which to achieve it. The integration was a stunning accomplishment and one that stirred the love of liberty within a generation of scholars and activists who proudly call themselves Rothbardians. I include myself in these ranks, unquote from Wendy. Well, I certainly include myself in those ranks. Uh, I, I think that this was, uh, I mean, Murray was just a gargantuan intellect and, and uh, leader of our movement. I want to tell you another story. Ralph Rako and I think Ron Hamway once went to Mises' house in New York City, and they try to sell Mises a subscription to the Freeman. Now, I don't know if you understand the context, but this was maybe in the 60s, early 60s. And uh, Mises said, I already have a subscription, and slammed the door on them. <laughs> they were, <laughs> there was a misunderstanding. Mises didn't understand. He was just new into this country. I guess he thought it was like the New York Times. Everyone had a, a subscription to the Freeman. That was the, uh, 
the journal that people use there. Another uh, story that I want to tell you is about Murray Bookchin, B-O-O-K, Chin, Book, Book, Chin. Murray, was, uh, <laughs> Murray Bookchin was a, a famous uh, left Marxist person who Murray Rothbard was sort of friendly with because they had an overlap on, on foreign policy. But um, Murray Bookchin insisted on uh, his leftism and you know, exploitation. He's sort of like a, a, a guy like Chomsky. Chomsky is, is sort of a libertarian, and, and Chomsky is, and Bookchin were very, very good on foreign policy. And they were even good on um, uh, US imperialism in foreign policy and on um, ruling class theory. Uh, let me just mention a little bit about ruling class theory. A lot of people reject ruling class theory because they think it's a Marxist, the wholly owned subsidiary of the Marxist, that uh, you know, uh, the ruling class theory is that the uh, proletariat are the uh, exploited and the bourgeois are the exploiters. Uh, but we also have ruling class theory. And sometimes when I tell my students of this, they rebel. They think, you know, th this is Marxism. Have I gone off the deep left end? But uh, we, too, have a ruling class theory, thanks to Murray uh, and, and others. And our view is sort of the Calhounian uh, idea that there are certain people that benefit from the tax subsidy system, and they are the exploiters, and then there are other people who are the victims of it. Uh, take this thing with Uber. Uh, Uber, Uber, the, uh, the taxi cab thing. They're the good guys, and the uh, traditional taxi cab people are the, are the ruling class in this particular case. Or Airbnb, where you can rent someone's house, and, and the hotel people don't much like this kind of competition. Well, libertarian ruling class theory can, can apply to that. Okay, what else do I have? I want to talk about... Ah, Murray with Hatred is My Muse. When I first started writing... I had, I had a little sign, the next article I write will be perfect. This one I'll just write. Why? Because if I try to make it perfect, I'll never write it. Because I've never written anything perfect in my life, and I never will. And I don't think anyone will, even Murray. No one writes anything perfectly. So I wrote, the next article I write will be perfect. This one I'll just write, and then I could write. Well, Murray, I don't think he ever put anything on his wall, but he, his... Motto was, hatred is my muse. And what he meant by that is he'd read somebody like, I don't know, uh, 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 Chomsky or um, uh, uh, New York Times or something like that. Or who, who are the people that Tom and, and Bob are after against? Uh, I'm sorry? Krugman. Krugman. You read Krugman and, and you get filled with hatred because, you know, I mean, Krugman is supposed to be a, a good guy and uh, uh, rather he's supposed to be bright. He has a Nobel Prize in economics and he favors the minimum wage, you know, so you read that stuff and, and you get sort of filled with hatred and you got to get it out of you, the venom, get it out and you get it out on paper. So that was Murray's, um, uh, Murray's idea. Another one, uh, I, I think Murray was very instrumental in... Um, um, uh, is Tom DiLorenzo here? Tom DiLorenzo is a little soft on Lincoln. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, Murray also made uh, points about the Civil War. It was just the War of Secession or the War of Northern Aggression. So it's not just me that follows uh, Murray's lead in various ways, but I think uh, 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 Peter Klein uh, w with entrepreneurship and uh, uh, Jeff Herbener and, and most of the faculty here are... Uh, Murray's, um, Murray's students. Now, some of the faculty are not Murray's students because Murray died in 1995, and some of the faculty are very young. I don't know what happened. I used to be the enfant terrible, the young madman, and now I'm the old duffer. It goes so fast when you're having fun, when you're enjoying, when you're enjoying your career. And I wouldn't give up this career for anything. It's just the, the most marvelous thing. Um, one of the, uh, my favorite piece of music uh, is by Handel, the Messiah, and uh, one of the songs is uh, uh, about Jesus Christ, that he was a man who suffered. Murray suffered too. Murray had uh, lieutenants, friends, colleagues, who, uh, I won't say betrayed him, but went off into the deep end. Uh, I've already mentioned Carl Hess. Uh, another person would be um, Randy Barnett who was one of Murray's, uh, uh, when Randy came on scene, he was a very, very bright guy. And he's sort of a warmongering libertarian. And, and Bill Evers, another uh, colleague of Murray's who uh, went off into the uh, Hoover Institution and 
um, uh, try to help the Iraqi government uh, have education or what have you. Uh, George Reisman also uh, was a, a follower of Murray's. He was part of the Circle Bastiat. The Circle Bastiat was a group uh, of people about four or five years older than me. Ron Hamoy, Ralph Rako, who stayed with Murray and, and were uh, friends. Ron uh, was friends with Murray to, till he passed away, and, and Ralph Rako still is. But then there's George Reisman, uh, Hessen, and Ligio, uh, and Grinder, who went off in various ways. Uh, let me just uh, mention one word about Walter Grinder. When I first met Murray, uh, everyone was focused on Murray, and Walter Grinder sort of took me under his wing. He was not credentialed very much, but he was very good in uh, Austrian economics and libertarianism, and he's another person who flitted away from Murray. Uh, I am a Murray loyalist. I am a, a bromancer of Murray. I love Murray. Uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs>